Good evening. Uh, welcome everyone to the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute Lecture Series. My name is Karthik Srinivasan. I am a professor of psychology here at NYU AD. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Professor Kia Nobre. Uh, Kia is the head of the um, Department of Experimental Psychology and the Chair in Translational and Cognitive Neuroscience at Oxford University. Kia is pulling double duty here on her visit to Abu Dhabi. Not only is she giving tonight's lecture, she also gave a keynote at a conference on visual working memory that we organized. As part of this conference, we've gathered uh, experts from around the world who study working memory, which is the ability to keep information in mind over short intervals. And this ability is vital for many elements of cognition. But that's not what Kia is here to talk to you about today. Not only is Kia an expert in working memory, but she also has expertise in areas of visual perception and attention. And that is what she's going to be talking to you about today. And the fact that she studies all of these things uh, together has really uh, enabled her to come up with sort of long-reaching ideas about the ways that we see, uh, interact with, and think about our world. Um, and we're particularly fortunate that Kia is here with us tonight because she was uh, almost literally putting out fires back at home uh, before she came here because it turns out that one of the buildings... Uh, at Oxford, they discovered asbestos in the building and had to evacuate. And so she's been very preoccupied with that. And uh, despite all the chaos back home, she's been able to make it here and uh, provide valuable uh, input at this conference and be here to give her lecture today. So um, our lecture is entitled Perception Where Future and Past Meet. Please join me in welcoming Kia. Karthik, I want to thank you very much for inviting me to be here. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here, and I'd also like to thank the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute, and thank you all for showing the interest in coming to listen, and hopefully I can provide you with some entertainment over the next hour or, or so. Okay, so um, what I hope to do uh, today is to take away from you some of the intuitions that you may have about how you apprehend or perceive the world. Um, and I kind of, well, in sort of thinking about uh, what to talk about, I, I reflected on what are the lessons that I've actually learned over my own career, uh, and what do I understand about perception now that I didn't understand as I was approaching the field, and what are things that perhaps are a little bit counterintuitive. So perhaps, um, like me, you have a very strong intuition that you perceive everything that's out there, that the world is there for you, boundless, rich, complete. Um, perhaps you believe that your perception has something to do with external reality, that it's real, and it actually picks up uh, real sensory stimulation coming in from the world. Maybe you think that perception actually starts from the outside with a stimulus coming in and triggering a response in your brain and in your mind. And if so, maybe then perception reacts to stimulation out in the real world. And we think of perception as very much living and existing in the present, in the present tense, it's about now. So I hope that I will not completely eradicate these uh, intuitions that you have, but maybe offer some refinements and different ways to think about them. And I should warn you that perhaps um, I will leave you with more questions than answers, or maybe I'll leave you with some different questions than the ones you already have now. And um, I also wanted to make the point that many of the insights that we have nowadays and things that we're able to investigate with our very powerful, or we think they're powerful relatively, methods, methodology, in terms of manipulating um, act, uh, behavior, measuring it, looking at the brain, many of the things we learned or that we actually can investigate have, are ideas that actually have been around for quite a long time. And this is, in a way, a double entendre or a second way in which my title makes sense, where uh, perception, where 
past and future meet. So I'm going to be uh, hopefully echoing some ideas that have been around for a long time from some of like our great, what I like to think of the very radical old guards that have actually established the seeds of our field of experimental uh, psychology. Okay, so let's uh, start with the notion that we have that perception is rich, it's complete, it's boundless, it apprehends everything. Um, I'm going to show you some demonstrations that suggest that maybe that's not the case. So uh, when I was a child, I used to love sitting by my grandmother uh, and trying to do figuring out uh, games like the seven differences game. And I was always astonished that I just couldn't, I could usually find about three or four things pretty quickly. But after that, it became really irritating to find uh, differences, and everything is just there in front of you. And some of these differences are very big, yet it takes us quite a long time to pick them up. So here, if you're curious, are some of the changes uh, in, in this particular uh, case. Now, I have a really difficult task today because uh, in addition to the you know, very erudite uh, lay audience and some colleagues in other fields, I'm also here full of like some real experts in my field. So I know that I can't actually get away with saying some things that I might be able to get away saying otherwise. So my colleagues here would say, oh, Kia, that is not really perception. You know, maybe you're having to maintain things in memory between one thing and the other, or, you know, it's not necessarily about apprehending or perceiving the world. Okay, so maybe we need to move to some other demonstrations. And over the years, people have gotten very crafty, very, uh, very expert at trying to show these um, different examples of our limitations in our perception. So um, in this following clip, I'm going to show you images that are flickering back and forth. Um, and I actually tried to find uh, one of these demonstrations that I hadn't known before. And this one is actually, now the advertising world has picked up on this. And this is about a little car in the front, is a blue car um, that they're um, trying to sell to you. Uh, and here's the, um, if you just follow along, hopefully this will work. <laughs> to test just how much attention, the attention stealing design of the new Skoda Fabia actually steals, we left one parked on this ordinary road in West London. We wanted to see if its sharp crystalline shapes, bold lines, and lower, wider profile would attract the desired level of attention. Will the 17-inch black alloy wheels stop passers-by in their tracks? Will the angular headlights attract the attention of other road users? Will a crowd gather to check out its fresh, sporty look? Well, not quite. But did the attention ceiling design distract you from noticing that the entire street has been changing right before your very eyes? Don't believe us? Have another look. Did you spot the van changing to a taxi? How about the scooter changing to a pair of bicycles? Or the lady holding a pin? Let alone the fact that the entire street is now completely different. Didn't think so. So there we have it. Proof that the new Skoda Fabia is truly attention stealing. <laughs> okay, so again, uh, you might think, um, well, you know, this, there's this flickering that's unnatural, things don't really flicker in the world, or what about if we're actually just watching a continuous scene? Now here I'm going to really disappoint my colleagues and I'm going to show the very, very classic display that was introduced um, by Dan Simons. And I'm sure some of this is a very famous um, um, demo, and so some of you, I'm sure, will have known about it from YouTube and stuff. But in the end, I'm going to make a different point about it as well, so I don't feel too bad about um, showing it to you. Plus, is if you're a novice to the world of perception and attention, you have to see this. Okay, so here we go. The monkey business solution. Count how many times the players wear it white past the ball.
The correct answer is 16 passes. Did you spot the gorilla? For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla, and there goes a player, and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business solution. Oops. So did anyone have the first time experience of the gorilla? Did anyone not see it before or is everyone? Yeah, okay, good. It is a, it's astonishing. I remember really not believing it when uh, I was shown. I thought I was for sure. So actually I heard it from Dan Simons. I thought for sure he was playing tricks and he had this whole video rigged. So uh, here you see something evolving naturally and we're watching it. You're engaged in, in a perceptual task. You're looking at uh, the scene, yet you miss some quite dramatic changes. Um, so here we already see that our perception is limited across space. Uh, and there's also demonstrations that perception is limited in time. So once you're dealing with something at a moment, you kind of have a little bit of a blink during which you're not able to sort of uh, perceive things as well for a few hundred milliseconds afterwards. But actually, I think perhaps one of the most striking examples of the limitation in our perception is not how much we can take in from the world across space or over time, but also even if you're dealing with a unitary thing uh, that may have multiple interpretations, the fact that the mind can only occupy itself with one interpretation of a stimulus at a given time. So here's an example that came out um, in, a, in a newspaper in Germany in 1892 and was then commented on by Wittgenstein, uh, the philosopher. And uh, this is known as the rabbit-duck illusion because obviously for some of us, we perceive the rabbit facing forward or the duck facing the other way around. And this will reverse over time and you'll have one percept or the other, but never both. Or I'm sure you're familiar with Rubens' vase, where again, you see the vase or the profiles, but never both at the same time. And perhaps the one that's most irritating, because if you're like me, you try to twist this around, but you'll, one or another interpretation of the Necker cube will force itself on you. So our perception is limited across space, over time, uh, and also in our mind, so that we can apprehend perhaps only one thing at any given time. You may think, however, that, no, these are all strange, tricky illusions, and maybe they don't actually apply in real-world situations when we're actually engaged in things that we know about, or maybe things that matter. Who cares if we don't see a gorilla in a video of a basketball game? Maybe that doesn't really matter. Um, but actually, I think um, one, it's, one of the things that is extremely important is that we all live under this illusion of complete grandiosity, of thinking that we can apprehend everything in our education systems, our interfaces. They actually don't take into account the fact that our perception is really limited and we can only deal with only a very few things at a time. So um, in our lab, we, had, I, we were working in collaboration with some anesthesiologists and people uh, working in resuscitation training. And... Uh, you know, medics, doctors are especially, uh, you know, worldly, arrogant human beings who don't believe in their limitations. So we actually ran, first of all, the gorilla, uh, the original gorilla uh, test on many medics, and they were just as bad as all the rest of us. But also, we also prepared our own, I'll have to admit, very boring gorilla video um, in which uh, our participants, which were either young, doctor, people training to be doctors, or they were actually trained anesthesiologists who are used to working um, in uh, resuscitation rooms, or people who actually taught the resuscitation course, so real ultra experts in the resuscitation uh, team. And we got them to watch a video based on a resuscitation simulation, and we asked them to 
watch the video and monitor for anything unusual that was taking place in the resuscitation procedure and then to then tell us about whether everything was done correctly, if there was anything that could have been done better, et cetera, in the procedure. So here's, a, here's our video of, there are no gorillas in this video. So, um, <laughs> Okay, so where's Mark? I can ask him what he saw. Oh. <laughs> they did a great job. Okay, so during this video, we introduced several changes. Some of them, uh, when the camera panned to the, oscilloscope, uh, to, the, to the monitor and back, and then others that were happening as things were taking place. And I'll just um, show them to, to you here. Um, so here's a couple of clips from before and after, and then here are some of the changes that took place. Some of these changes were completely trivial. So for example, the hats, the colors of the hats changed, or the stethoscope around the person um, was not there and then was there. Then the human being who was providing the CPR swapped, these two men swapped. Um, and more, but then others were more important. So for example, the, the device that was delivering air to the person was changed. And also um, the oxygen um, one goes off at the sign and, it's just, uh, and there's very loud sound with the oxygen going off. So for example, not noticing some of these final changes if this were a real resuscitation situation, this is also a, a simulation of a resuscitation, would be really problematic. So for example, the oxygen going off could kill the person. So um, how did our participants do? So here you see the percentages of the young people, like novices, the anesthesiologists, and the experts at detecting these things. So people were, were really bad at detecting these. And even though high expertise in, the, in this resuscitation situation helped a lot, people were still only less than half, uh, half less than half the people noticed the airway device um, being changed or the oxygen going off. So um, I would argue that actually uh, us becoming aware of these limitations and perhaps designing resuscitation rooms, classrooms, interfaces that actually enable us to cope with uh, the information that's around us would be sort of a really important first step. So uh, there are still limitations here because it's very artificial to be watching a video of something. What you really want to do is actually do this test within a real life, you know, in, uh, embodied situation. And that's actually something that Paul Grieg, my uh, student, um, has been doing. So he actually, these, these guys here are all people who work in the, in the resuscitation training team, and they are now like really good deceptive artists, and they can change clothes and swap around and swap things and disconnect things, break stuff. So they have this routine that they go, and actually these poor medics come in and they're trying to train, and they either are in stressful or not stressful situations, and all these changes are taking place, and we can then debrief them and also watch where they're looking with the eye tracker. And the good news is, People are much better in real life, so they're not as terrible as here. But the bad news is they're still pretty bad, actually. So I think this is uh, just an area that I think um, we need to rethink about our intuitions. So hopefully by now you're not so sure that our perception is so complete, and maybe you think, okay, well, maybe our perception is, is a bit uh, impoverished and selective. Um, and as I said, we have seen that perception is highly selective across space, over time, and also in our mind. And we only perceive a few items and possibly only actively interpret one at a given time. What about the things that we do pick up? Are they, are, do we just pick up information that's out there? Is it real? Is it veridical? So is our perception just an impoverished, veridical 
catchment or reconstruction of an external environment. Okay, so um, here I'm gonna show you uh, another side of perception. Sometimes our perception works really well. So I'm gonna show, flash you a bunch of images uh, of complex scenes, and I want you just to notice whether you see that, whether you think there's a car in each of these images. So this is amazing. I mean, you were watching these really complicated scenes, and you can probably tell on each of these scenes whether there was a car or not. So we have all these limitations on the one hand. On the other hand, if you're trying to look out for something, you're really good at picking those things up. Now, if I asked you, like now, like to tell me how many of those scenes had trees in them, you'd probably have no idea, because you weren't really focusing on trees. You were focusing on cars. So um, I think one really important point is that it's not that our perception is terrible. It's just that it's, it's selective in a good way. Most of the time, it's working to serve our ongoing goals. So in this case, we were looking for cars. We got, we're pretty good at doing this. So what we take out from the environment is not everything is equal, but things that are important to us and uh, that are relevant to our task goals are prioritized. So what we take in is highly biased and determined uh, by what's important to us at any given time. So... Over, over the years, as you, know, you go through graduate school and, and thinking about these things, you actually come up with this dilemma that maybe most of us tend to think of our perception from a phenomenological point of view. We think of it as perception as being like a rich, immersive, unraveling fil a film that's there kind of to entertain us and sort of give us some inspiration in, in our musing and our thinking about uh, the external world. But really, as scientists, what we learn is that uh, the way that we behave when taking information out of uh, the environment demonstrate that our perception is really good at guiding adaptive behavior. Um, so maybe through evolution and through generations of, of learning, this, the brain has learned to pick up and to focus on things that are useful and adaptive to guide our behavior, our adaptive behavior, and sometimes our purposeful and goal-driven behavior. I have to say that one thing that still persists for me as a mystery is this um, tension between, on the one hand, all of the studies that I'll be talking to you about today, talking about this kind of very selective and flexible nature of perception, and on the other hand, this illusion that we have, that we do apprehend all, and how those two sides of the coin come together is still something that I think we haven't been very good at understanding as scientists. So how the phenomenology comes together with this adaptive ecological approach. So you may wonder, you know, is this a good thing or is it a bad thing? Is it a bug or a feature? Well, it depends. If you really want to believe that you have the whole world out there that you can muse on, then it's, you know, it's a bit bad news. But on the other hand, if you want to get on in the world, do stuff, succeed, have fun, achieve things, then our perception is, is really what you need. Okay, now there's another concept that's around uh, quite often when people think about perception and what we are able to pick up from perception, what we can attend to they tend to think of our perception or our attention as having limited resources or having a limited capacity. So um, the idea that comes to mind is something like, well, you have a certain amount of stuff that you can put into your current focus or your current um, perception, like you can fill up some bucket. And then once you've run out of stuff in the bucket, that's it. You can't attend to things anymore. Or maybe it's like some kind of currency, some kind of gold that you have. You've spent your gold, that's it. You can't actually do anything more. So uh, I think that's a very useful concept, but I think it also takes us away from what's the more interesting aspects of thinking about why our perception is limited. So I like to think about it in a different way. I like to think about it as uh, our perceptual analysis or what we take in from the world has to overcome many challenges that relate to the way in which the brain processes information. So we know this is a, a, another classic um, diagram, and it's also outdated, very outdated by now. But it's a diagram that shows, if you just take the visual areas in the brain and you just kind of color code them each as a little box, we have many, many visual areas, and some, and some of them are specialized for processing colors or motion or object shapes. Um, different types of motion, um, 
biological motion, flow, and all of these things are divided up into all these different areas. They're all processing different aspects of information. They're highly interconnected. So somehow, um, eventually, you need to like, get all this distributed stuff and pull it all together and integrate it back into something coherent again. So we have this highly distributed parallel processing. And in addition, if we focus in on even any one of those little boxes, what we see is that inside we have brain areas with millions of cells, and that the information is actually not coded in individual cells, but across populations of cells, again, processing information in sort of this distributed fashion. So again, trying to integrate what those groups or ensembles of cells are doing within these different areas, which themselves are doing specialized things, and then putting all of that together, those are the challenges, I think, that our system has to overcome. And um, finally, we're also dealing with biological units that are a little bit noisy sometimes, so they're not always completely reliable. So, other, you know, so they're also a little bit probabilistic, so there's also that kind of um, problem as well. When we do sort of confront a scene in some of these areas, for example, like in this green area here, some of these visual areas respond to stimulation over large parts of the environment. So for example, let's say you're looking at this scene of this nice girl doing some shopping here. And if you're looking straight ahead, let's say you're focusing here on the arrow, there are some cells, in some of, like in that green area, and some of your other visual areas, that will respond to stimulation all around, like almost half of the field. So how do you know what that cell is processing? Is it processing a green apple, red apple, dates, oranges? It's all there. And if it all gets averaged together, you're going to get jumble out of that. It's not going to make any sense. So in this way, we also know that our perception or the analysis of incoming information is highly competitive. So um, I think the challenge for us is not just to, uh, to say like our you know, attention is, is limited in capacity or resources but it's to understand uh, what it is that the brain can take out in terms of information from a system that's competitive, highly distributed, noisy, and information from which you can do many things. I mean, this girl can choose an apple, she can look at it, she can think about something else, she can throw stuff, you know, there's many, many different things, so she also has to link those representations to the action plans, not to mention that there are smells and sounds and all of these things which are also themselves being processed at the same time. So this is, I think, the challenge for perception, and I think some of the ways in which we understand perception to operate now suggest how the brain kind of overcomes some of these challenges. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to our intuitions, and the next intuition is that our perception starts outside. So if we think about it, of course, it seems like if we think of vision, for example, we start off from points of light hitting our retina. Uh, these get integrated into features like colors or motion, these features are put together into objects. These objects come together into events. These events come together into episodes. And we go from the outside world into the inside world, going from sensation to feature analysis to object recognition to integrating these into context to putting things down into short-term memory or to laying them down for future long-term memories. And if we look at usual diagrams in books where we have, let's say, a, a stimulus, appears. This is a typical diagram actually by Steve Hilliard, who is one of my great heroes, so I don't mean any disrespect, I just happen to have this one diagram here. Um, this idea that if you have, like, for example, a visual stimulus and you record activity from people like, with electrodes on their head, you'll see a series of waves uh, or potentials, changes in voltage, which represent activity across millions of neurons that are co-active. And the idea is that, that we have is that we start from zero, there's nothing happening, and then a visual stimulation comes and it elicits this, it like, you know, pushes the brain into some kind of response or action. Well, that's not true. And we've known this is not true for a very long time. So from the very first measures of brain activity, um, from Hans Berger, who developed the electroencephalogram, the thing that he noted is the brain is not flatlining. It's not like you plug electrodes in if nothing's happening, that you just have a bunch of flat lines. It's always very active, and there is structured activity in the brain. And one, for example, one of the things that Berger saw, this was his original equipment, in, which is on display in Jena, where he worked, is that you have these kind of rhythmic waves. And uh, these were the first ones he saw. They're very big. They're very prominent over posterior brain areas. So because it was first, he called those alpha. And then he discovered beta and other letters. 
so nowadays, we all know that if you sit someone in a machine, now we can be much more fancy about how we record. Our equipment looks a bit nicer, and we can record the brain, and it's kind of always doing stuff. And um, you can take a little piece of activity here. So for example, uh, if you just take a, a bit of recording from one channel, we actually know that in these rhythms here, there are lots of embedded rhythms within it. So you can apply some interesting physics and mathematics approaches to sort of take, separate out all the different um, speeds of rhythms that are going on. And you can see that there's some very high frequency rhythms riding on top of some slower rhythms and even slower rhythms. And this is happening all the time in the brain. And nowadays, we think that uh, these rhythms are not just noise, but somehow the state of the brain um, uh, as it's you know, going through these different rhythms, that changes how easy it is for the neurons to respond or not to respond to something. So depending on exactly when something occurs, the neurons may be in a state that is very easy for them to respond or less easy for them to respond. So this, in turn, will influence our perception. So there's, by now, I think over the last 10 or 20 years maybe, um, but more increasingly so, like over the last 10 years, there are many, many demonstrations. If you record these rhythms in the brain and you can use these kind of fancy methods to, to look at what rhythms in the different frequencies, so this is the alpha band, that first rhythm that Berger um, showed, which happens between 8 and 12 hertz. If you just happen to put someone in a task and get them to respond when they see um, a visual stimulus and you make it very dim, so that half the time they see it, half the time they don't. And then you separate out when people are good at detecting those stimuli and when they're not so good at detecting the stimuli, and you compare that, you see that the brain was in a different state. So here at zero is the time that the stimulus appeared, and this is a difference when people are good or bad at this task. And before the stimulus happened, and before there could be any contamination in any kind of analysis thing, the brain is in a different state that's more, that is more likely to make you respond accurately or not. So these rhythms are there all the time and they're influencing the brain activity. We can measure these with these electrophysiological methods, but we can also measure them with brain imaging methods like fMRI or M magnetic resonance imaging. And I'm sure most of you have heard about MRI. MRI measures uh, blood activity, so blood flow that's correlated with neuronal signals, with the uh, brain cells being active. And again, if you put, something in this, put someone in the scanner and just leave them there, don't tell them anything or tell them to do nothing or anything they want, what you see is that there is spontaneous activity in all the different bits of the brain. And this spontaneous activity turns out to be structured. And for example, areas that work together, so like the different visual areas, their up and down activity will tend to go up and down together in a correlated way. So you can use methods to try to separate out which are the different um, points in the brain that are acting in a correlated way. And if you do that, what you get are these networks that we know are functionally relevant networks. So you get the visual network, um, you get some motor networks. I can't see the motor network here now here. Motor cord, you know, all the motor areas. And we get some of the areas that we've been talking about in our conference here, so that's, which we think are some areas that are involved in controlling um, some of our perceptual processing. And this is just from people basically idling and doing nothing. So when we think about, mm, does perception start outside? Yeah, it starts outside, but actually information coming from outside is interacting or perturbing um, this dynamical system. So, what we, so the perception is a result of an interaction between external stimulation, but also our internal states. So the brain is not a passive idle organ, and even at rest, it is full of structured activity. Then the next question is, does this activity, this um, activity influence our uh, perceptual analysis? So actually, one of, I told you about these limitations that the brain has to overcome in order to perceive. Um, and one of the ways in which we believe that this problem of overcoming this competitive, distributed, challenging situation that occurs is by this process of what we call selective attention. So this process of selective attention is this idea that the brain uh, is proactively, in an anticipatory way, uh, prioritizing and selecting the relevant information that it's expecting in order to guide the perceptual analysis. So, um, so we have, in any scene like this, we have two sources of influence that happen. First of all, we have 
the things that evolution sort of picked out to be potentially relevant to us. So things that are very fast, loud, bright. Um, yeah, yeah, I can't think of any example, other example now. So those things are basically naturally, they have an edge within the comp competition because that's the way our systems are built. Because if something is very fast and growing very quickly and approaching you, you probably need to do something about it. Um, but the other thing is that in addition to these natural um, automatic kinds of influences, there are these what we call top-down influences. So whatever goal state we're in, if we're you know, wanting to attend to cars or wanting to pick out a, a red apple, then that puts the brain in a state that makes it easier for those things to be pulled out and for other things not to be processed. So in this way, instead of like that cell perceiving all that stuff, it's going to focus and pick out a specific item within this cell, within, within this um, array. So we have lots of nice experiments in the literature that show this. I think the one that shows this most convincingly, actually some experiments were um, Leo Calazzi recorded from the activity in individual um, brain cells in visual areas in, in a monkey. So in this task, for example, the, the, the monkey has to see, gets a stimulus, in this case it's a cup, and then it knows that when an, a choice comes, he has to look at that, that particular uh, stimulus. So if you record from visual cells um, in this task, what you'll find out is that some objects, let's say, for example, the cup, that cell responds a lot to. And if you put another object, let's say a foot or something, it doesn't respond very much. Um, but then you see that during this waiting period where nothing is happening, the cell is already in a different state. The activity, the amount of um, units of activity or firing of the cell is elevated if the animal is anticipating that stimulus that that cell likes, that effective stimulus. And when the array shows up, again, you have this anticipatory activity, and then even though that cell, both of these stimuli are inside the cell, the cell will respond as if only the relevant stimulus in is inside its catchment area. So, oops, if the, if the, uh, if the target is something that the, the monk, that, that cell likes, then the cell will fire a lot. And if, if the uh, target is the, the object that that cell isn't very responsive to, even though the good stimulus is in there, the cell will shut down. So the cell is not actually seeing everything in its catchment area, it's only seeing the relevant things. And we can also see that in humans, so we do the same thing and put humans in MRI machines, and we can compare the pattern of activity across visual areas in the different boxes or voxels that we call them of activation in the brain. And we see that the pattern um, of activity when the person is waiting and anticipating having to uh, detect a specific target, so in this case, uh, participants had to detect an X stimulus, the brain goes into the same state as it would normally go into if it was actually perceiving that same stimulus. So you can show that there's a similarity in the brain seeing nothing but anticipating or expecting to see that X. Uh, it's already in the same state of when it sees that X itself. So what it means is that all the, the firing of the neurons are already prepared so that when that X comes, everybody who is selective for X or likes X is ready to go and that'll be picked up and the other stuff will be left behind. And we can see that this, in this case, is in the area of the brain that localizes to these visual areas that are processing object shapes. So if we go back and think, um, you know, is our perception reactive? Maybe not so much. Here's another uh, example. We talked about Wundt in our conference uh, uh, yesterday, which I think is a very ingenious old master. So Wundt did a really interesting experiment. Um, so one of the things that I'm very interested in is how we anticipate things in time. And he did this nice experiment where uh, you can tell that this was done some time ago. It's a very elegantly dressed participant here. And the experiment also very elegantly dressed, unlike most of us these days. Um, not you guys, us scientists, I mean. Um, so here's uh, the scientist. And, and the task of this participant is to go when he hears a sound. And, uh, and what Wundt found is that actually this person would be much faster to react to that sound if he were able to see the mechanism that would produce the sound. So if he's watching that mechanism, he knows exactly when that sound is going to go. And if he knows that, he can anticipate and he can go off immediately. But if he has to wait and react to it, then he'll be much slower. 
So uh, the brain is not waiting, it's, 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 it's anticipating things, and it can also do that in time. So here's an example from my lab, um, not quite as uh, fun as, uh, as Wundt's, but it kind of also shows this, the fact that the brain anticipates things in space and time. And it's an old experiment that we ran, but I think it makes a nice point, and I really like this experiment. So here, the person has to keep their eye on the center of the screen, and there's a dot that shows up, moves around, and it's moving uh, with this constant spatial trajectory and rhythm, and then it reappears, and the person has to make a discrimination as to whether there is a little dot in it or an X or a plus. Um, and we, as I said, we get people to keep their eyes in the center of the screen, but they can kind of follow. Uh, and in this case, you, there was spatial information, so you knew where the item was going to appear, but there was also a constant temporal rhythm, so you knew when the item would appear. And we contrasted this kind of situation to a situation where you have a bit less information. So, for example, in this case, um, the ball moves, but you don't really know where it's going to um, go, and it moves with different rhythms, so you actually don't know exactly what time it's going to come out. So if we do this and we measure the activity in the brain when the ball does come out, um, we're averaging out all those nice uh, oscillatory things, so we're just going to look, it looks like the brain is starting from zero, but we know that it doesn't really start from zero. Uh, but we see as a response to this stimulus appearing, and we see that this response is bigger if the person knew where it was going to appear, compared to if it appeared in the same place, but they didn't know where it appeared. And you can see that this response, if we map it over the head, where is this response coming from? It's coming from the visual cortex, which is coding this particular stimulus on the other side. But now, if we have not just spatial information, but if the participant also knows exactly when the item uh, is going to appear, um, then that, that change in response is much bigger. So if you know when, as, as well as where some, something is going to occur, then your brain responds to it much, much more strongly. So not everything is the same. Things will hit your, your system and will be processed to a different extent, depending on your, your ability to anticipate them effectively and if they're relevant to you. We ran another experiment just very similar to this, but there we actually recorded activity in the brain during this period of time when nothing was happening on the screen. The person was just anticipating this item reappearing. So it was during the occlusion phase, and we compared the case where they have temporal information when they don't have temporal information. So here's a little schematic of what we see in this task. So this is, there's only like, there's one invisible jump behind the occluder, so the ball shows up, has one invisible jump, and then shows up again at the end, and you have to make a discrimination. And here, Berger's alpha band. So here's this change in activity in the brain between 8 and 12 hertz over the visual cortex. The whole excitability in the visual cortex, when nothing is happening, is changing up and down with that read preceding rhythm in anticipation of what's going to happen, so that when the item happens, the brain is just in the sweet spot, in the right state of excitability in order to process that stimulus. So I've learned that the brain really is not a, a reactive machine, but is highly proactive. It's not an idle organ. It proactively anticipates stimulation to guide our perceptual analysis. So we can see that perception is an interaction between external stimulation and our internal anticipatory states. And of course, we all know, so basically, we're never really perceiving what's happening now, but we all know what happens, right? So we're always perceiving what's uh, happening next. <laughs> so in that sense, perception is a little bit about the future, um, but it also brings our states and our goals and our things that we have in mind to influence these things. And here we go to the, uh, the other great giant uh, in our field, William James, who says that this organic adjustment or this ideational preparation or pre-perception, as he called it, is concerned in all of our attentive acts. So the idea is, unlike what we think of perception starting outside, there's also information coming from inside to guide the way we put information into our system. Okay, so in the final uh, section, I want to tell you that, you know, perception is not really all about the present. So, um, as I showed you the gorilla video, some of you had seen the gorilla video, and if you saw that gorilla video before, or any gorilla video of that kind, you saw that gorilla this time. There was no way you could avoid seeing that gorilla, and in fact, you probably saw that gorilla and didn't manage to do your counting very well, because you were, like, expecting the gorilla the whole time. 
So in this sense, our long-term memories and our experience are also shaping what we actually take from the world, what we perceive. And again, we have some nice uh, experimental demonstrations by colleagues. So for, here's a, a, another kind of classic uh, experimental by Moshe Bar, who's in Israel. And for example, you have a stimulus like this, and you might wonder, what is this thing? I don't know, it's like a smudgy black thing. Uh, might be a drone. So, but if I show you it in context, your knowledge and your memory of those kind of contexts will help you disambiguate, you know, maybe this is a hair dryer, or I would never, I would have no idea what this is because I don't do manual work of this kind, but this could be like a drill. Uh, so again, it's our experience that help contextualize and shape and ultimately determine what we perceive. So we have uh, illustrations like that, and we also have experimental tasks where we can manipulate the extent to which a stimulus occurs within a learned or experienced or novel context. So Marvin Chun, for example, has done some beautiful work in tasks which we call visual search tasks. If you're looking, for example, for a target, in this case is a letter T, um, your response time to find that letter T will be much faster if that T occurs within a uh, array, a context which has been repeated over the trials, even if you haven't noticed it, even if it's if you're un unconscious of it, but your brain has learned these regularities, then if it appears in a novel context. So in our lab, we wanted to use some of these types of ideas and see whether we could investigate this, the way in which our long-term memories change our perception. So we've kind of developed um, a different kind of way of, of doing a, the similar thing. So we, we've done many studies like this, but I'll just show you a couple of examples. So, for example, you might come to my lab and volunteer and sit down and I, I'll, I'll put you in front of a computer and show you some scenes like this and ask you to look for a very small hidden golden key. You might look around, you might think, oh no, what am I doing here? So, so here's a little key and then here's another one. My, is. I'm sure it's impossible for you guys in the back to see it. And then here's another one. So we do this, and depending on the experiment, you might get 100 of these, or 200, or 250. And if you get 100 in, within two hours, you can learn all of them really well, up to basically 99% accurate. You can learn them by just five exposures of each, each scene. So again, this is the mystery that our brain's not so bad at doing some of these things either. So we've now created all these new memories in people. We send people home, and we bring them back the next day, and we ask whether these new memories that they completely arbitrary, which they never had before, whether if we show them that scene again, whether that changes their ability to perceive that little target occurring within that uh, scene. So we do these kind of um, very simplistic uh, visual experiments where people are presented with a, with a scene and that they have a memory for the location of the item, but the, the key is not in this scene now. So the, the whole thing shows up, disappears, and then the whole scene shows up again with or without a key, and they have to say yes or no, I can see a key in this scene. And if you do that, if you have memory for where the key is going to appear, your ability to see that key and to make a correct judgment about its presence or absence is much, much better than if you don't have the knowledge of where it's going to be or, or if the key appears in a, like a, a different place from where you learned. And we can do this task while we're imaging people's brains. We can see that the areas of the brain that we know are important for allocating um, spatial attention and directing attention to different parts of space become active um, when they see these uh, scenes that have these memory associations. And we can also look at what happens in terms of the visual cortex. Uh, so this is like taking the bits of the visual cortex and just showing them as if they're displayed uh, open like this. We see that depending on where the person is now anticipating the key to occur based on their memory. There's no key in the scene. There's nothing different about these scenes. They're all balanced so that different people get different scenes for different conditions. But you see that the, the visual cortex is already preparing before any, the, the, the target appears to process things coming from the right location. And we can also do the same thing and record activity from the brain with uh, EEG and we can show them these scenes and get them uh, to respond when this key appears. And again, in this period where they're waiting, they're just anticipating the key to appear, there goes Berger's alpha band again. And you can see the whole change in visual excitability in anticipation of the target occurring at the right location. 
And then when the key does happen, you get this response, and that response is modulated by whether you have memory or no memory uh, for the item. So the last uh, very short experiment I'm going to tell you is that the brain can not only anticipate things based on memory, but it can also do that dynamically on a millisecond to millisecond base based on knowledge of temporal uh, intervals of things. So we have the same kind of idea, but now we have a task where we have a, a, a target. In this case, it's the coloring of a little bomb that people have to uh, respond to, to deactivate the bomb, just to make it more fun and engaging for people. Um, and, so, and these things occur either early or late after a scene is presented. So in this case, this thing happens relatively early. In this case, it happens relatively late. So people build these associations, they learn these things happening early or late, and then we send them home, bring them back, and we test them in the same way, and we show that people can learn these temporal associations, and also just the knowledge about the timing of these events will help people discriminate and react to these stimuli much better. So the brain anticipates things, it also anticipates things with, in time, in, dynamically, with, with great temporal precision. And we can measure the brain activity, and we can see this anticipatory change of the, of the brain. Um, this is like looking at these potentials that when people anticipate stimuli, you can see that the timing between the red and the gray line are different, because in the red case, people are anticipating the events to happen very soon, and in the gray line, they're anticipating things to happen much later. You can see that the brain is in a much better state of preparation if they're anticipating something to happen very soon. And we can see all kinds of relationships between these effects and how good people are with their response times, um, their quality of, of their perception. So with these kinds of experiments, I think we can rule out this idea that perceptions all exist only in the present, and we can think that perception actually uses the past to anticipate the future. And this brings us to another one of our old guard giants, uh, one of my favorite, uh, Hermann von Helmholtz, who says that reminiscences of our previous experiences act in conjunction with the present sensations to produce a perceptual image. Actually, we learn to perceive and our memories guide our perception all the time. So we started out with some intuitions about our perception, that our perception perhaps is complete, boundless, veridical, that it starts outside, that it's reactive, and that it lives in the present, and hopefully Maybe you don't believe all of my conclusions, but maybe you're thinking about things in a slightly different way. Um, but maybe you're uh, more open to the idea of our perception being limited, but highly selective, um, being very adaptive and flexible, and as occurring as an interaction between the external stimulation and the internal state. The internal state is functional, so it's proactive and adaptive, and that perception brings the, pres the past into it to anticipate the future. So that's all I wanted to tell you about today, and I would like to thank you again in my lab, uh, my great lab, homeless, but together. So thank you.